Hello and welcome again to the Engineers Bench podcast. And today, this is a break from our tradition, me and Phil chewing the cud between us. Chewing the fat, actually, we might chew the cud as well. We have a guest. We have a special guest in the form of the mighty Rupert Watson, it says here on the notes, of Route 6 as well. We are getting, we're now outnumbered by Route 6 um, <laughs> Rupert is in, in the north somewhere. Is it, is it sort of Norfolk? Mm, I know. You see the beam. And I'm over, say again. As you can see the so beam I'm, behind me. Look at that. Real Norfolk beams. And I'm in Gloucestershire. And this is a real Gloucestershire shed. And uh, Phil is over in London. And, <laughs> so today we're going, to be talking, <laughs> we're going to be talking about shared storage. So sharing stuff. What a great idea to share the screen. Um, right there. Um, uh, Ruth is... is the one of us that knows lots and lots about shared storage, having actually used it in anger as an editor, I believe, certainly desirous of such things, even if he didn't use them, I don't know if he did, he'll tell us in a minute, I'm sure, but now knows all about the knobs and whistles and screwing things and software. <laughs> so, Rupert, tell us a little bit about the um, shared storage. What's the history of it? Where does it come from? Um, and, and has it only just arrived in the last few years with the arrival of handful of disks well i think um shared storage has been around obviously for a very long time in the sense that you know you can share your word documents one of the sort of major challenges that sharing video posed was obviously one of bandwidth and size um and it was really not until avid unity came along that there was any credible media sharing environment which was a fast enough although kind of comical by today's speeds um and b large enough and flexible enough to allow a facility class um, environment to, uh, to to use it in anger and get paid by customers for so doing. Um, and although it seems odd now to look back and think of shared storage as a sort of uh, something you didn't have, back in the day you would typically as a facility be using your recently enlarged SCSI disks, which you know, only recently had got large enough to store enough data on for a say, documentary edit. Uh, and you would be swapping and switching Nine pin, uh, sorry, nine terabyte discs with um, they're very fiddly SCSI cables, and the SCSI cables had 36 pins, I think it was, possibly more, uh, all of which could uh, very easily get bent by a runner as he attached your disc in the morning. So, generally speaking, the, the standard uh, standard protocol in a facility was to get in in the morning and discover how many suites weren't mounting the uh, editor's media for today's edit, and get the needle nose pliers out and you know adjust for. Um, <laughs> At that and then hopefully by about half past ten everyone was you know full of toast and coffee and actually editing so the introduction of avid unity meant that you could have a, a bunch of storage all those nine gig or yeah, not nine gig discs at the time but all the discs that you had in a chassis i think it was a clarion emc clarion array back in the day known as a media array when it was badged by avid and they were all put in a pile hidden behind a, effectively a metadata controller as it would now be called and dished out to the various suites using fiber channel one gigabit fiber channel we, uh, we think of that as an Ethernet speed these days, but back in the day, that was the high-speed media gateway. Uh, and obviously, then, the, the various suites could share as much or as little of the storage as they needed. So you'd, um, instead of having chunks of 9 gigabyte uh, storage, some of which you know editors weren't using, some of which editors were using all of and needed more of, you could now use a workspace to parcel up you know, 1 gigabyte for that room and 20 for that room and 2.5 for that room. And it essentially allowed the facility owners to purchase... A fixed amount of disk, but to parcel it up in unlimited in, in unlimited numbers. And in fact, the way in which you could open and close the workspace, which was a feature of Unity from the word go, was and to some extent is quite revolutionary. I mean, there aren't that many user interfaces even now for shared storage that make it quite as straightforward as Unity did. And I can remember having Quantum or ADIC, as they were called at the time, or possibly even Lockheed Martin when it was Centrovision uh, guys having a look at Unity and trying to tell me it was shit. <laughs> uh, and thus showing, showing them, you know, it may be slow, but look, can you do this? And that really was the key. It was very easy to use, and, uh, you know, engineers could pop in and, and, and sort of make and share workspaces and resize them on, uh, you know, as, as they were being used, although you weren't supposed to do that, uh, but people did. And um, it was very successful, although in the first instance, facility owners couldn't work out how you charged for it, much the same way that these days you hear them squeal that they can't work out how to charge for LTO archives. Yeah. Um, you then found people like Charlie Leonard at Nats telling, you, telling us that there's no way anybody could 
make the money back, the outrageous amount of money that we wanted to charge for Avid Unity, um, because you couldn't stick it on the on the um, on, on on the list. You, know, you can you can say, and for using storage, it'll be this much. And and they yes, it's one of those things. As a, as a facility owner, um, it's it's something which the client can't actually take away. It makes it very difficult for them to um, to agree to purchase. Mm, and, absolutely. You know, and and well, the other thing was, it, 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 you know, they they wouldn't pay for for library shelves, you know, where you really had physical stuff taking out actual rentable space. So, <laughs> you can imagine the more yeah, fly producers the were. Um, thing that seems to, the other thing that seemed to happen was that um, you you kind of found them selling the, the the shared storage in nine gigabyte chunks. You know, they kind of taking this um, sort of physical entity, which was the nine gig drive that people could understand and presumably were prepared to pay for. Uh, and, and sort of superimposing it on, I guess it was it was kind of units of management as well. And and I can remember there, there were sort of huge discussions with us as a support operation as to how, um, because of course you're on shared storage and, and on on media composer as it became more and more capable, you'd discover that um, you know producers who wanted a slightly better looking image were, were quietly digitising it, you know, AVR seventy five, uh, and consuming much more storage than they uh, they'd been dished out by the bookings people and uh, and mysteriously filling up the shared storage. So it, it brought its own challenges, but um, it, uh, it, it it solved an awful lot of the, the kind of bottlenecks that uh, individual edit suites were suffering from at the time. And I think you know pro programs like Big Brother that Phil and I worked on um, from the word go wouldn't really have been able to work, I suspect, as well, or certainly not as as, as, as inexpensively without shared editorial storage. I mean, Phil Phil probably can tell us about the life at the sharp end. So Big Brother um, yeah. was only really possible because of shared storage. Um, at the time, uh, we went over to Holland, to, to Hilversum, to see the operation they had for the, because, because it, Big Brother had, in, in 99 had run twice in Europe, uh, once in Spain and once in Holland, and it had been run entirely on a tape-based model, you know, several um, Sony 9100, you know, traditional tape-based edit suites with absolutely skip loads of digibeta tapes. And and an army of army of runners and an army of assistants making VHF review and approval copies, and they reckon that the um, the post production budget for a ten week run of Big Brother was shaking down to be kind of greater than five million euros per season, uh, and you know for a ten week run that's an awful lot, um, and um, Roger Moffat and Ian State, who I used to work for at Resolution, they sort of sat down and worked out a, a workflow of, of, yes, you need a half hour show every night and a, and a live show on Friday night and, and these are the packages that'll have to be made and blah, blah, blah. And we reckon we can do it on 10 media composers and an Avid Unity, which we had one already. We, we had a, um, a version uh, 121, I think, Avid Unity at Resolution, which we were using for daytime um, uh, documentary type shows like Pet Rescue, you know. That's those kind of mm. things, yeah, and um, it could come from Route Six, um, and I think it was, I think it was, five hundred gigabytes or maybe even a terabyte, um, three Clarion chassis um, of eighteen gig drives, um, and uh, and then uh, we had a, had a similar configuration for Big Brother, so we had the whole of Big Brother on less than a terabyte of storage, and that was a three. So do you just let me sort of step back a, a, a moment and just think about that you. Everything was going, of course, at, at standard definition. Yeah, standard so def, and we, we were running it three to one, so 90 three. megabits per second. And what was the file format that you were popping down to? Uh, so th those were Meridian Avids, so um, uh, that would have been Avid, uh, it wasn't MXF, it was Rupert? Well, I meant, well. Sorry, say again? Oh, right. no, yeah, yeah. yeah. But there, there were, everything was recorded on IMX. Tape decks in the gallery. There, twenty-four IMX decks, was it? No, six. Uh, was it six? Was yeah. It so, 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 well, so the workflow is you have two two producers who are both following um, action in the house. I mean, we, we don't want to make this a, an expose of Big Brother, but but um, <laughs> uh, you, you know, and you've got essentially three records for each um, uh, of the. Uh, uh, of the of the two producers, so so you know the A team and the B team, and one's recording a close shot, one's recording an ISO shot, and one's recording the diary room uh, with all associated audio on all tracks, and and that's all going into the um, uh, the low resolution proxy um, uh, uh, you know review and approval system which we resolution wrote, and uh, and then and then it's all being recorded onto. Um, uh, uh, 
do you remember Beta SX tape? Sort of uh, mm. oh, very, gosh, yes. very cheap and yellow, cheerful. Yeah, yeah, yellow. And they were actually they were actually Beta SP tapes that didn't hit the grade for being Beta SP. They were lower quality than Beta SP, but sold for more money, strangely. Um, and 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 so and so the, yeah, the first hit was on tape, and then tapes were digitised into the Unity. So. You know, obviously, we only kept as much on the Unity as we needed. It was it was a real kind of slash and burn. Things were constantly being deleted off the Unity as a workflow. And 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 just so this is what mid nineties, is it? No, this is two thousand, two thousand one. Yeah, yeah, two thousand one. And I can remember my wife questioning whether or not it was moral to make this program. Papa came to us and told us about this hush hush program that Resolution were getting involved with, where they were going to shut people in a in a house and film them. And um, we, we had significant, well, our job didn't, obviously, but um, you know, we, I had significant qualms about the kind of morality of doing this and being involved in such a, yeah. a strange and unusual event. And uh, look at us now. Well, they've been, <laughs> I mean, they've it been does broadcasting play. Parliament for a long time. That's pretty much the same thing, isn't it? Mm. <laughs> yeah. I think there were questions in the House about Big Brother as well, on a similar level. You know, is that we... right? Should we, be, should we be doing this? So, yeah. Doesn't society move fast? So I've just, just as yeah, uh, whether it's a good idea. I uh, just to, to give yeah. engineers a chuckle, and any anybody who is an engineer will, will appreciate this. Um, uh, quite early on in the production run, Channel Four came to us and said, "We know you're cutting on a SAN uh, on shared storage. Um, don't you dare transmit off that. You lay back to videotape and you transmit off tape." But yeah, as, we play down the line to them. Yeah, we, yeah, we 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 play we play into Channel Four Press from um, from the site. Uh, we had a BT facility line, um, but um, as as the show ran on, it proved wildly successful. And Channel Four wanted another half hour every night, and some stuff for this new E4 channel that they were just launching, and stuff like that. We realised that the, just our, our ten suites and how many was twenty eight editors wouldn't be able to just quote. Like fine, didn't with they, a, they cut it to the wire because of yeah, course, yeah, absolutely, the, yeah. The, the opportunity to be able to do so, they they cut even closer and closer to the wire. So we would we would we would quite routinely broadcast off the unity. We would play to line off the unity. And my fear was that one of the avid uh, fault slates would go out on air, media offline, wrong format, those things that avid sticks out on its SDI output when um things go wrong. And so I replaced all the avid um fault slates with uh, with a, a, a screen a screen grab of color bars, of BT color bars. So if, if it did happen, people would think it had happened at the tower and not at sight. <laughs> So this this amoral show that you were having such <laughs> oh, a you yeah, didn't yeah. mind just lying to the entire nation. It was, <laughs> it, was it was covered in immorality. Should it go wrong? <laughs> it was telecom. They they were big enough to handle it. I don't know. I, 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 one does wonder that might well have incurred all sorts of enormous fines. I don't know if they were fashionable back then, but certainly yeah, <laughs> these days uh, it's uh, it would you know, the minute you're off air if you if you're Disney or whever you kind of. Um, there are all sorts of penalty clauses, aren't there? Anyway, yeah. those were the days. Those I remember days. driving there in the middle of the night. The Radiohead were playing a concert in Port Meadow, up in Oxford somewhere. It was the only one they played that year. And it was absolutely no perfect. And I can remember listening. It was a late summer driving. In the draw. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> bit, of d- bit of now. domestic joy being... being uh, yeah, being, no, she's yeah. off to see a friend in Swaffham and she... Um, <laughs> Doesn't know where she's going in Norfolk, so she uh, she needs a sat now, which of course I I've hidden. Um, fact, surely she can see it from the house. Yes, the trouble is all the junctions look the same. Anyway, okay. Uh, right. If if I can d- drive us on, so so I suppose Average Unity was was kind of the early example of film and TV shared storage. It was it was it was the sound that people use for television, etc. Um, I mean, uh, we at Route Six we sell many shared storage products probably more so than any other category of stuff we sell more than the different kinds of edit workstations you can buy from us more than the different types of tv test equipment you can buy from us or monitors or whatever you know the, our, the sort of the, the biggest section of our sort of notional catalog on our website is shared storage um and uh, the, 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 sort of the big industrial um kind of file system that you often find on on fiber channel um, or fibre attached storage is is SNFS, you know, the quantum file system. Do you want to tell us a bit about that, Rupert? What what the origins of that are and and where that fits into? Um, I mean, it's what DVS essentially sell. It's what Xan was. Absolutely. Well, like, like all um, like all good technologies, uh, it came out of the military industrial complex, and um, rather like trackers. Trackers were, I think, originally designed by Marconi for tank aiming. I think, um, but. Uh, the Stornex file system started life by, uh, I think it was Lockheed Martin, and they had a product called Centravision. And ironically, we got vaguely involved in that 
just as we left Avid, just before we started Route 6, I remember doing a little consultancy gig trying to get Centrovision storage working with um, with Media Composer with a little um, in it. Do you remember uh, Max used to have the little things that appeared along the screen as you booted them up? And I remember they had they'd written their own little kind of um, in it that allowed you to mount Centrovision. That then, and that's why it's called CVFS. It's called Centrovision File System. Oh. Uh, and then on Windows. And then gradually um, they got purchased or Lockheed sold the, the, that unit to uh, ADIC, um, the Advanced Digital Information Corporation, possibly, something along those lines. Yep. And they moved it along and that became Storenext. Um, that was its marketing name, file system. So that's where SFS came from. And that, that's typically what you find on Linux boxes. Um, and they OEM'd it to Apple along the way. And it, effectively, it, it was a very good... Um, and by that point, quite mature bit level locking file system. And really, the only thing we were interested in was the file system. It does have a, a much larger estate of, of essentially hierarchical storage management, which drives all the quantum libraries these days. ADIC were a, a tape library corporation as well. But we mostly focus on the high speed um, secure file system, which is run by dual, hopefully, usually dual metadata controllers, which um, can fail over in the event of a problem on the, on the primary. And uh, under test, and DVS, who we work with a lot, who do a lot of high-end uh, video playback and, and sort of 2K and now 4K, and indeed 8K um, disc recorders and disc playback devices have been spanking discs for over 25 years. And they tested a variety of shared file systems, and Stornext um, came out top. You know, it was fastest under load and allowed us to play back um, you know, 24 frames a second of 12 megabyte uh, DPX files in the right order in the right you know in the right sequence without dropping them so that's really why Stornex became the kind of the primary shared file system for media up until that point it had been used by a number of people but generally speaking either the discs underlying it weren't sufficiently tuned or um there they just wasn't really um a successful configuration made of it so a lot of people had had a go at using Stornex for uh, shared storage for high-end video and, and film playback, but it was really when Stor when DVS came to, to, to town that we started um, seeing success in that in that space. You mentioned the discs not being tuned. To this presumably well, is a, a grading approach to to, to finding discs, is it? Or... Oh, I, I think um, uh, partnering with oh, people no. like I mean, at the time we partnered with or DVS partnered with a company called Zyrotex, who were IBM based, okay. so they were um, based in Havant. And I think they used to be part of IBM's manufacturing team. And they, they had very high-speed ray controllers, which they'd created in um, conjunction with a company called Chaparral, who then became Dot Hill. Um, but really, it was a question of understanding how the, the, the ray controllers worked, working in conjunction with um, ray controller manufacturers to tune their firmware such that they behaved in a manner that's consistent with trying to get lots of large files off in, 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 in short order. And um, also... I'm saying my, my, my colleague David Povis has a very good analogy, which is the Stornex file system essentially stripes the LUNs that you create out of your disks so that you've effectively got a RAID 5 or RAID 6 um, LUN, which could be you know 5 or 6 disks, and there may be a number of those in a number of arrays. You then effectively present those to the Stornex file system, which stripes them in their entirety into what they call a file system, or in Apple terms, a volume. And essentially what happens when you write to the Stornex file system as it's presented to your operating system, it's writing the data simultaneously across all of its stripes. And then obviously they hit the RAID controller, which then in turn write the data onto the disks under the RAID controller's control. So there are effectively two layers. There's a hardware layer and a software layer in Stornext. Yeah. Um, uh, but it, obviously you need to tune the hardware layer to the extent, you know, to, to, to the maximum. And you also then need to get what they call the stripe breadth and the block size correct for the file system and the hardware to interoperate correctly. So if you imagine you're unpacking or packing a box of books, you pick the books up in your arm. If you're lucky, you pick up the right number of books that fits exactly into a shelf, and you might have six shelves to fill. If you are clever or lucky and you've got a stripe breadth, as it were, which is arm's width, you can pick up the book six times and have filled your bookshelf with no kind of extra, you know, going back twice or, you know, because you've only picked a half of a shelf width or you've picked up wider than the shelf width. Essentially, that's what you're trying to do with the Stornex file system is find that perfect sweet spot. Uh, and we've got a large number of iometer script 
and, uh, and, and uh, a lot of tests that we run to work out what that spot is on their hardware we encounter. And that's really what they perfected that interaction with the hardware vendors, the quantum Stornex file system, and they put the two together, and ultimately you get the highest performance you're, you're likely to get out of the two. I've, I've currently got, Rupert, up on screen the, um, the Avid MediaNet um, uh, configuration guide uh, from, 19, uh, from, from 2000 for Avid MediaNet 1.2 something. Um, and uh, the, 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 w- w- one of the images um, is, uh, shows the, this idea of, of uh, you know, uh, racks of fiber channel disks, a fiber channel switch, and a bunch of clients hanging off the same fiber channel switch. And the thing that always used to tickle me, and I, don't, I, I never really kind of appreciated kind of how close to the metal it all was, was that from each of the NT workstations, you could see all the disks. You know, it wasn't as if that had been abstracted from you. You could see all those things, and it was this kind of magic of, of a metadata controller that kind of allowed it to work as a file system. You know, and from, from any of the NT workstations, you could kind of go and really mess up the array by doing things to the individual disks, you know, just by, 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 by virtue of the fact you had these, you know, scuzzy but over fiber, you know, fiber channel disks attached to your, to your workstation. Um, so yeah, it was a, Sorry, go on. It was a strange configuration of both fiber channel and almost kind of, eth- not Ethernet, but the sort of network shared storage. So whilst you were attaching to it over fiber channel, it did mount as a, effectively a network drive. So obviously this gives rise to a, a, a block sharing SAN. Is that a correct kind of expression to use as opposed to a file sharing SAN, which is, I suppose, a slightly more modern invention? Is that a good differentiator? Yeah, I suppose so. I mean, really, really, the, the, the difference is to, um, the way Avid Unity worked is effectively you had a, what was you know, a metadata controller or a file manager, as it was called. And essentially, you, you, it went to the file manager and... and yeah, asked what data was where, and then once it knew, it, it, it went to it. I think, as I recall, if I recall correctly, that the, the Unity file manager wasn't in the way all the time. Effectively, it would the information was held in RAM, and it would go to the to the sort of fiber channel storage based on the information it had received recently. The metadata control in Stornex is pretty much constantly being in, interrogated over Ethernet, whilst the data is moving over fiber channel. With Unity, in fact, one of the clever things about Avid Unity was there was no metadata Ethernet. It was all done over fiber, both the metadata transmission, as it were, and the media transmission, which made it incredibly simple to set up by comparison to the other shared storage environments. But I suspect it also caused it to be slightly slower. And effectively, that was the kind of criticism that was leveled at it by people like ADIC at the time. Oh, it's much slower than we can get out of those disks which was to some extent to miss the point because Avid had designed it to be easy to use and easy to install um, by comparison to some of the other shared storage systems that were around at the time. But you're right, you could, um, if you were unwise and you booted your Windows NT box and you left an editor in charge of it, it would pop up this rather innocuous message that Windows had of saying you need to write a signature because the disks were essentially raw as far as the Windows operating system was concerned. Uh, and if you had an unwise version in front, they would merrily click away uh, on, the, on the OK button writing signatures to all of the disks that they saw and it usually it was between three and five where they'd start to wonder what on earth was going on that was probably one that was four more disks than they they thought they'd installed in the system uh or you know attached to it and uh, and after a while they'd, they'd sort of phone someone and say something might have gone wrong here and i think the first facility i ran into who did that they lost their entire data set because of course avid weren't expecting somebody to do it but um i think after version 1.1 they wrote a little app that effectively allowed you to go back and restore the signatures to the, um, you know, the, the, to the and status quo ante. But uh, that was that was a, that was a dark night of the soul when that happened to this this this, this company. And of course, Avid got the blame. They they didn't admit to the, um, the the willful destruction of their clients' data, and they were all busily redigitizing the next morning. So obviously, Ooh. that's with Unity and and then with with, with DVS SAN, you know, based on 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 SNFS uh, file system. Obviously, very expensive. You know, lots of big metal, and and obviously we've installed a few Unities in our time. And and DVS SANs. I mean, I think the first DVS SAN I came across was a job that we were both or all three of us involved on the um, midnight transfer. Yeah. Um, oh, yeah, build, transfer, yes. which yes. Um, uh, was a DVS SAN. Um, now, but obviously we, we've sold an awful lot of um, sort of cheap, much cheaper shared storage systems since. Um, and and then sort of the first one, I suppose, that you sort of qualify as a cheap shared storage system was, was the Mighty Terra block, um, which kind yeah. of, I suppose, fundamentally was a bit different from, from a proper SAN again. 
not only in price but 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 Rupert what yeah Terrablock was clever in that it was um, very fast but but by comparison to the existing systems very very inexpensive and the trick they basically um, did was they used Atto cards they they had a very close relationship with Atto and were able to um, leverage some of the technology in the Atto cards more perhaps than other vendors it was a block level SAN or or block based SAN as you, as you refer to Phil, which basically meant that you mounted it as a fixed disk, um, as a read-write fixed disk on one workstation, and then on the other workstations you could mount the same um, formatted volume as a read-only, kind of a, a, a removable disk, so it would appear in Windows as if it were, were removable. Um, now that's different to Stornex, because Stornex is bit-level locking and is effectively a fully shared, sh shared, shared SAN. You can basically read and write willy-nilly, you can, you can do what you like, where you like. Um, but with uh, with Terrablock, you kind of the, the compromise was you, you paid a bit less money, you got some performance, but you essentially addressed your your disk in inverted commas that you mounted directly as a read write, and then the other guys got to read it, and obviously you could switch that around such that somebody else mounted it as read write, and everybody else got to read it, and that was a compromise people were prepared to make for the you know the money as it were, um, and then gradually we moved from fiber channel sands to Ethernet based SANS and iSCSI SANS, which was really the next the next stage. Okay. Interestingly, because we started we started with differential SCSI back in the day. We didn't mention it, but the dark days before fiber channel shared storage, we we had differential SCSI, which was an absolute nightmare uh, and probably is, is worth glossing over. Anybody who actually tried to edit on one of those things. Um, the, the first the first order of the day every day was to run naught utilities to get rid of all the corruption that had been caused the previous day. But necessary to get to get another doubling of speed kind of thing i mean you've got to have that noise immunity using differential mm. pairs to, you know but but yes. perhaps perhaps the technology wasn't quite ready for it so i think so that that would people refer to as scuzzy 3 lvd low voltage differential which yes. um, yeah, uh, yeah, you know like you say the pins were tiny the cables lasted a week and you know it was that's right yeah and you, uh, you had a sort of lun a lun dis, um oh God, it was it was a sort of i'm not even sure i can't remember the terminology i've, I've erased it from my brain it was so painful it was known as media scare for a reason. Yeah. yeah. So, so you, but you made reference there to iSCSI, Rupert. So, so, so obviously iSCSI runs across Ethernet networks, um, and yes. and 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 you think to yourself, well, if if I if I've got my shared storage coming across a gigabit connection, or at best and occasionally a ten gigabit connection, but don't I have the burden then of of protocols that have to sit on top of TCP/IP, either SMB or or NFS? Um, those kind of protocols. What, what what does iSCSI bring to the party, and, and and why does that allow people to do Ethernet shared storage? Well, I think I mean it's worth mentioning at this stage, of course, that compression schemes or, or compression technology has has increased in its um, capacity to create nice looking images for a modest data payload. So we're now effectively using um, bandwidth less than we would have used for an uncompressed standard definition for transmitting uh, or, or you're moving high definition video files around. So typically a DNX HD185 is of the order of 23 megabytes a second, which is a bit more than uncompressed SD used to be at about 21. Um, but the, the way in which you can, and that's certainly small enough to be able to poke it down um, essentially a Cat5e e or Cat6 cable with iSCSI protocol running across it. And because iSCSI effectively is... Um, uh, a SCSI protocol allows it allows the workstation to mount the disks as fixed disks in much the same way as they would have done with fiber channel shared storage. So with an iSCSI initiator from Microsoft on Windows or from someone like Ardis on, on the Mac, you can attach um, storage presented as iSCSI targets on clients running an iSCSI initiator and treat it as if it were a fixed disk. And the difference there is, is if you're using NFS or TCP IP based protocols like uh, or Samba or ADP, um, Apple's um, ADP? Yes. No. AFP. Sorry. AFP, thank you. Chattery, yeah, chattery, forward. AFP. <laughs> um, you, you, you're essentially relying on, on a, a much more... Um, the, the protocol isn't really designed to move video. You can change, change things like you can turn on... Um, you know, large packets, you can um, turn on flow control at both ends, both of which things you wouldn't generally do on, on a sort of standard data network. And that does ameliorate things. And it is indeed possible to play video over a standard, um, you know, SMB or, you know, Samba network connection. But iSCSI just makes it that much more predictable 
and you can be confident that you've got most of the available bandwidth that you're going to get down that cable, electrically speaking, I suppose. So all the all the sort of contemporary um, things, I mean, I, you know, I really only know the products that we sell, but things like DDP and Object Matrix and Isilon, do you want to give us a bit of a bit of a run through of where where they hit the spot and and, and you know where where, where one benefits over I'm the other? You, roughly speaking, you've got three categories of storage, if you, if you like. You've got shared storage, which effectively is you know, of the store next time. We're sharing fibre channel devices that are very fast that you would otherwise attach directly to your workstation, um, and that's sort of yeah you know, for, for, for kind of uncompressed high definition and, and that kind of sharing. Um, you've then got um, effectively NASes, overgrown NASes, which are um, boxes like Isilon, which have very clever file systems which allow them to grow at will. But fundamentally, you're attaching to them using um, industry standard protocols. You know, they, they're using NFS, they're using um, CIFS. They're, they're, they're effectively network protocols that are not ones that they can control. You then have products like Harmonic Media Grid, like um, Avid Zysis, like, um, well, I suppose, like iSCSI Sands, where you're effectively installing some sort of initiator or driver or control manager um, in order to attach the storage. So with Harmonic, you need to install a bit of their software in order to see their storage. In Avid, you need to install Connection Manager. With um, iSCSI Sands, you need to have an iSCSI initiator installed. Uh, and, and you're effectively communicating with storage using um, somebody else's it's kind of drivers, as it might be, or somebody else's is, is, is kind of in control of the pipe. Um, and th those really, I suppose, are the sort of three broad categories. And you've got people like EditShare who are using standard network protocols but are effectively doing some clever things with things like um, you know, Media Harmony, or w w which effectively is taking the SAM protocol and hiding information within it as it were so i think in, in the first instance i'm not absolutely certain how edit share are doing it these days but i suspect it's similar they conceal from each of the avid clients the smb so the the um the database files and the pmr file which they all attempt to maintain individually and that's just a, a sort of a clever way of allowing you to use network storage but without the uh, the downsides of, of the way in which avid fight over and i suppose in, in, now you, you've got to the point where Products like MXF Server and um, Flavor Sys Strawberry, um, and potentially I'm not sure that the, of the other ones, but I'm sure there are other bits of software around. They, they lay on top, if you like, of the shared storages and allow you to access them, um, regardless of the fact that, for example, you know, Avid doesn't like, uh, or Media Composer doesn't like talking to storage over which it doesn't have complete control, unless it's talking to an Avid, Avid Unity file system. And then I suppose you've got products like TerraBlock where they've got um, the ability now to emulate the Avid Unity file system. So when Media Composer sees storage, if um, it asks the question of the storage, you know, who are you and what sort of file system are you, it gets back an answer that is essentially what it recognizes as being Avid storage, then it will go into shared project mode. You'll get the little green lock in the bin and all that. And that's essentially what... Um, what Terablock is capable of doing these days, and I suspect probably other people are able to, to do it as well. They're effectively spoofing the reply that you would normally only have got from an Avid Unity or an Avid ISIS. And so all of these uh, that we're talking about, these are all, as you said, shared storage, everything, uh, all the users could be uh, writing and reading to and from them as if they were attached to their local machine. They're all live. Then, Well, all, all except for the... Um, it's really a question if you, if you if you call to mind this on my computer window that you get up if you open a Windows um, operating yeah. you know, Windows operating system, you tend to have different um, areas of the screen. Some of, you know my computer, and then you have fixed disks which have a particular area. Then you have you know if you stick a USB disk in, it's a removable disk, uh, and obviously if you have a network a mapped network share, it it goes in a yeah. slightly different area. And if you imagine sort of things like the the Stormex file system and the iSCSI appear as fixed disk to the operating system. With the TerraBlock, the drives that you were in read-only mode on appeared as removable disks because that's the way in which you kind of spoof the operating system to, 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 to allow them to interoperate. Um, and then obviously people like Isilon, that they're appearing as a map network drive. Um, and then any NAS that you, you have, the small tree have the system and there are lots and lots of, of vendors these days who can stick a, a reasonably high speed chunk of 
disk on the network, as it were, and, and you can read and write to it. I mean, on, on the whole, it's possible to use pretty much any NAS that you, you find off, off the shelf these days for, for modest bandwidth. Uh, and it's only when you start to ask significant questions with the shared storage that you, you maybe um, hit, hit hit a wall. But essentially, if you've got a switch and uh, and the NIC on the NAS can handle flow control uh, being turned on, and um, you can, less importantly, but maybe for larger data rates that sort of set the MTU to 9,000, those two actions in themselves will... Um, will fix most, if not all, of the sort of video playback issues you have at sort of modest bandwidths. Um, so uh, these days, it's quite difficult not to play back video from a shared storage. It, it's it's a question of whether or not it's kind of mission critical and, and whether or not you yeah. mind your drop frame. Um, harder and harder is, it, or not harder, the more difficult thing is working out at what point you've saturated it. Because the thing you tend to find with, with storage manufacturers who have less experience in the video arena is they tend to take the number that you get when you test the disk, so you might thrash the disk with some disk test program, and you get a maximum number from it, and they take that, divide it by, you know, whatever the, so if you say, I need to get this many streams of DNX HD, they might take their maximum speed, divide it by 23, and go, yeah, you can get this many streams of DNX off it. It's not quite that linear. You do tend to find that, despite the fact your system is testing at three gigabytes a second, you won't necessarily get three gigabytes divided by 23 megabytes number of streams off it it's 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 more about then there's a little bit more subtlety to it that and the vendors that you want to work with typically are the ones who understand that and have been able to test meaningfully um their storage with um you know with the sort of video streams that you are going to be pulling off of. but if you're only using a modest number you know maybe two or three or you know you've got a couple of edit suites generally speaking you're in you're in, you you these days it's a reasonably safe bet that uh, that a sort of modest uh, nas will will provide you with the ability to share media across it assuming you've got the ability, for example, with Avid to um, mitigate the fact that they that Avids don't like to you know share storage. They tend to write their media files in the root of the storage. Um, so you'd need something like Strawberry Flavor Sys or Strawberry to uh, to get around that. The, the classic so thing. Notwithstanding the oh good. Sorry, Hugh, Bill, go, you go ahead. No, no, you you, you chat. I was just saying. So notwithstanding manufacturers' independent foibles, you're actually going to find it a lot easier today than you would have done. Um, to, to make a, a meaningful network of, of shared storage without trying too hard, as long as you don't go too esoteric and find people who've recently got into the game as a, as a way of finding a different market. But, the, uh, the thing I found very interesting in, in the early noughties yeah. was a lot of companies, and I think MPC spring to mind, they built a big Silicon Graphics SAN, whose technology I don't know anything about, whether it's a Stornex SAN or whatever, I don't know. But um, they, they, they built these huge SANs and kind of everybody in the company almost was on the SAN. You know, the guy in graphics was on the SAN and the editing clients were on the SAN. And you think, my word, you know, just half of these people just don't need to touch that shared storage. It's very expensive, you know. Just just expose it over, over your Ethernet corporate network and, and let the graphics guy pull the odd frame off or whatever. But um, the thing that, that seems counterintuitive, but, but, but I think, you know, you hear often people say is, is Pro Tools rooms. Pro Tools rooms don't play nicely on SANs. Because it's not there, it's not a throughput issue, is it? You know, 24 stems of uncompressed audio is not a great data load, but it's the fact that you might have, you know, 100 files open at once, um, you know, and it's and all of a sudden it's 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 not a throughput issue. It's a it's a how many files can I open and close, um, very quickly. That's just a little observation. Absolutely, and that that you, you kind of put your finger on the great sand debate, which is typically, and really it's it's the sort of irre the irre irreconcilable. Um, difference between two competing requirements. You've either got people who need high IOPS, and they generally tend to be kind of database people and, and, and people who are kind of thrashing the sand with lots of little reads and writes, versus the people like us, um, who are generally speaking quite badly served by sand manufacturers, who want large video streams and generally speaking want to open up and play um, you know, large files in sequence for long periods of time, which isn't necessarily something that SANs that have been built for large databases, which frankly is where the money is, uh, are able to do that well. So you, you discover that Stornex is jolly good. And, and really that goes back to what I was talking about, sort of optimizing the disks. You're, you're really looking at, in our world, until quite recently, either you get good streaming performance or you get good IOPS performance. And the company called DataDirect um, claimed with their 10,000 range, which is the most recent 
or in fact there's another one now, but the, the, the most recent box that they could provide within one unit good IOPS and good streaming. But generally speaking, it was held to be very difficult to do both well. You were either storage that could do spectacular IOPS or you were storage that could do very good streaming. The advent of SSDs, however, has thrown all of that entirely up in the air. And it's now possible on a single SSD to get more IOPS than you used to be able to get out of an entire RAID, you know, array with 12 spinning disks or whatever. Um, so it's, uh, it, it's, it's all changed at this point in time. And storage is, is increasingly migrating at least the metadata onto SSDs. Um, oh, although really? I think so I was going to ask about that later on, yeah. So SSDs are actually making their way into this game. Yes. I mean, the, the, the thing you'll hear about SSDs is their short lifespan. If you typically SANs get hit hard because they are on all the time, they're being read to and you know, written to and read from incessantly by multiple people, you know, effectively they're being whacked with a stick from all directions all of the time. Uh, and and then they do have a finite life. In fact, the Midnight Transfer SAN definitely after five or six years of, of hard work, the discs were def you know, were, were starting to, to, to die. Um, the SSDs take much less time to, in inverted commas, die. And what that actually means is they don't fall off their perch. They simply no longer are warranted by the manufacturer, i.e. you can't replace them for free. Um, and obviously, the more you use them, the quicker you're going to use up the cycle. So essentially, the way that the SSD manufacturers term it is they, they sell you a disk and they go, right, that's good for, I can't remember the numbers, but yeah, N thousand writes, at which time it's end of life. Now, that doesn't mean magically on the 24,000th write it'll go poof and disappear. What it means is, at the end of 24,000 writes, that's your lot. Seagate, you're on your own. Right. Right. That's your disk, you own it, but we're not going to replace it because you've basically used it. It's gone, as far as we're concerned. You need another, another new one, and then you can start again. So that, 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 that was a bit that I didn't really understand. I thought, well, how, on earth can they, how can they know it'll just... Or how could you use a disk that will kind of magically disappear at the 24,000th write, as it might be, uh, although it's actually much larger than that. But I think DVS did some tests with a Stornext uh, uh, SSD Bay SAN, and under continuous operation, it doesn't take all that long to use up all your rights in it with SSDs, which, as I say, it doesn't mean that they stop working magically, but it does mean that you now have effectively a RAID full of disks that aren't warranted in the sense that, you know, the storage manufacturer is no longer going to send you a new one when one fails. So I guess what that means from an engineering point of view, you need to understand when that point will occur and have you know, spares sitting on the shelf ready to go, as it might be, which you won't be able to summon from your warranty. So it might be only six months into the life of your shared storage oh, wow. that you're now essentially reaching into the cupboard to pull you know, spares out to, to replace disks that are failing but have long since gone past the point at which the manufacturer warrants their, their behaviour, as it were. So this is actually quite an interesting point. And Phil, if we've jumped out of sequence, pull us back in again to think about some rules of thumb, because um, many of the people who, uh, who might be looking at this might be thinking to themselves, well, how do I go about sizing a storage and, and estimating the bandwidth requirements and, and stuff like that so that I can get to the numbers of A, what do I need to do to start buying? But also, how do I start calculating how many hits my drives are going to get so I could start putting some numbers together to see if I've used up my free writes? Well, just, just thinking about reliability of drives, the, the thing that always used to bother me when I worked in facilities, and it was the case when I worked at Oasis in the mid-90s and Resolution in the late 90s, early noughties, um, even before we had SANS, we had big 10-way, 12-way striped sets of discs hanging off of DSs and 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 Haleos, if you remember that particular compositing machine. Oh, um, yeah. yeah. Um, and, and the thing that used to bother me was I knew that, that the manufacturer would say these drives have a mean time between failure of 30,000 hours, typically, um, you know, for sort of media grade, um, you know, type devices. And, and, and if you do that, work that out, it's like four years or it's, it's a phenomenal amount of time for the mean time between failure. So what are they saying there? Well, if you look at the Gaussian distribution, you know, most of the drives are going to be up around the kind of the middle peak of the Gaussian distribution. And, and the mean time between failure is right up there, 30,000 hours. Some are going to fail at one hour. But very few are going to fail at one hour. And very few are going to last to 100,000 hours. The mean time between failure, though, is 30,000 hours. Uh, but if you stick 10 of them in a box together, the calculation is, 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 a, is, a, is a reciprocal. So it's, it's one over the overall mean time between failure for that chassis is equal to the sum of the reciprocals. And so for 10 
discs that have a mean time between failure of 30,000 hours. The mean time between failure of a chassis of 10 discs, that's putting aside the fact the power supply has a mean time between failure figure as well, but just for the discs, is down to 3,000 hours, and that's only 20 weeks. And so mm -hmm. in even a medium-sized facility where you might have you know, five or 10 disc arrays around the place, you know, that's why you talk to any engineer in a facility and they're replacing discs on a weekly basis almost. Yeah, and you know, the bigger the sand, as you say. Yeah, the absolutely. The, work, the larger the sand, the more discs you have, the more likely you are to be changing them. And we've got customers with very large Isilon installations and uh, it's, you know, it's not quite daily, but it's certainly regular enough to be, um, you know, they get quite familiar with the process, should we say. Because a modern hard drive is packing data so densely onto that, onto that surface um, you know, so, so for example, a modern two terabyte hard drive has a Viterbi decoder built into it. So, so it's constantly, you, you, you know, having to make error correction of the signal that comes off the heads. The, the signal that comes off the heads is so noisy that they have to use the same style of Viterbi decoder that they use on a DigiBeta to recover stuff off tape or, or that NASA used to recover signals from deep space probes where the signal is actually of a lower level than the overall noise. And, and so, you know, it really is just staggering that it even works at all that the, 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 the drives last for an hour you know let alone 30,000 hours you know that <laughs> blows me away and that's why you've got one terabyte discs in your sony cameras although they're solid state to be fair but i think that the the the, the, um, the arrival of solid state has changed an awful lot of the kind of um, the metrics as, as it were not only of the disk failure kind of characteristics but also of the performance um, and the metadata, particularly of, of these disks, you can get much, much, much higher um, IOPS out of them, which means that you can, with a standard Stornex file system, if you were hitting a bottleneck, it was likely to be the metadata response, um, you know, the disks. And, and now when, if you take those and you replace them with SSDs, then obviously you've, you've unleashed a whole um, uh, amount of uh, data that can be read, read, read and written to those disks in, in very, very fast. So what are we seeing? So the last few times we've sort of put DVS equipment into places, and every time I look at the DVS sort of catalogue, they seem to be offering SSDs now as their part of their standard build. Are we selling a lot of of of, of storage products with with SSDs built in? Mm. I mean, typically we we all the metadata we ship now are SSDs because it makes such a significant difference to. Um, Certainly, the Spicer Box SAN has always got RAID 1 SSDs for metadata. Um, and I think at NAB, you'll be seeing a, an interesting Spicer Box, which I think will be entirely made of SSDs for the Japanese 8K market. And it goes like a rocket, I'm told. Okay, so obviously, that's, now that's that it's, it's information, Phil, but uh, it's, uh, I think it's on the card. Oh, yeah, first. Oh, yeah. They'll, they'll be showing, they'll be showing a, a sort of a stunning box, which goes I don't know, some, some incredible figure. That it can it can produce um, in terms of data rates. Uh, you like, like, like you say, for 48, 48 two and a half inch SSDs. So if you think one SSD can go faster than an entire array of the traditional variety, imagine what forty eight can do. Right, but I mean the 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 the, the, num the amount of storage required for eight K, or rather the amount of speed that you need to pull out of an array is is you know four K is four times you know HD, and an eight K will be uh, sixteen times HD. That's a it's a phenomenal data rate, isn't it? Just, just. I think that what's happened is that, and we're we're, we're off topic a bit here, but yes. essentially what's happened with 4K or Ultra HD, as it's now being remarketed as, um, is that we've left behind the notion that you work in any sort of uncompressed way. The the, the idea that you you're dealing with uncompressed um, DPX files, for example, at, at 4K, has is kind of pretty much gone with the birds. Um, certainly for for mainstream production. I mean, there's obviously still a few feature films who'll be. You know, kind of rocking the the, the the uncompressed DPX workflow, but it's looking like XAVC and JPEG 2000 will be the two flavors in which 4K and indeed 8K in due course arrive. And I imagine H.265 will have its part to play as yes. it's uh, it's been ratified recently. That 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 will start to um, make its presence felt as as well. I should I should imagine. But yeah, it's um, the data rates will be large, but they won't be quite as spectacular as they would have been if we'd sort of pursued the uncompressed. Um, all the way. Well, like a lot of politics, it's the art of the possible, isn't it, really? So. Yeah, I think, you know, realistically, there's only so much money available to do these things. Um, and I think as the broadcasters are trying to work out, you know, what, what's the sweet spot? You know, if, mm. if 4K televisions are, you know, 23 grand, you're just not going to sell that many of them. 
I think the the unique thing about high definition was that an awful lot of people bought high definition televisions before high definition was available. Uh, and I don't think you get to pull that trick off more than once. I don't think that people are going to buy lots of 4K televisions before 4K televisions are available. I think that's that's a historical anomaly that won't repeat itself somehow. So, Although one of the drivers of these things is often sort of where you least expect things like things like Sony Playstations. And apparently the next PlayStation iteration, which is in the next few months, supports 4K. Mm. You know, and a lot of people bought PlayStation 2s because it was a cheap DVD player, a cheap but good DVD player. You know, back in the late nineties, a lot of people bought yeah. PlayStation Three because it was a cheap but good Blu-ray player. No, I know. I mean, the appetite people 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 have for these things is is, is unpredictable, and I, I'm you know, better men than me have failed to to predict uh, you know kind of the kind of home the home users' reaction to these things. But obviously, from from a commercial perspective, Ultra HD is a driver for technology. I guess it's if nothing else, it's a sort of Formula One type of scenario where people sort of. You know, test their metal on the kind of the difficult stuff, and that gradually kind of filters down. Uh, even if it's even if it's better compression techniques, you know, H.265 will deliver much much smaller file sizes for for, for equivalent um, picture qualities as to say H.264. So that in itself, I imagine, will have have an effect. And obviously, at the moment, and it's always the way with current technology, you couldn't possibly transmit 4K. Well, guess what? We won't be trying to transmit 4K with current technology. We'll be using the technology that arrives in you know, three to four years from now, yeah. and that won't be the same as we're using now. So one always finds people making this mistake that you can't possibly do that with you know, what we've currently got. Well, that's right, because we're not going to be using what we've currently got. We'll be innovating on that front as well. You know, transmission encoders will move along in, in exactly the same way as, as, as everything else does. But uh, right now, it is difficult to see how, how it would pan out. And as I say, it's, it's mainly the price. But I didn't think we'd ever see OLED tellies in, or OLED monitors in the edit suite. I thought that that, that ship had sailed because the, um, the economies of scale that LED and LCD manufacturers had achieved meant that the OLED had missed the boat. But in fact, sure enough, there are OLED there monitors. Are. Hmm. Most grading suites, and very nice they are too. So these things, these things have a way of coming to pass. Uh, yeah, and that really has all come together since about last year, hasn't it? Pretty much, yeah. I mean, OLEDs, we were looking at OLEDs, what, at um, probably IBC last year? Not, uh, oh, no, it was PV last year where we were going, oh, look, that was the first time we saw the one. Uh, the, the Sony PVM and BVM. Yes. That was the last year, I think. So it's been through IBC, and it's or NAB, IBC, and now, you know, everyone's kind of, oh, yeah, I've got an OLED in my grading room. Yeah, no, no. When I, when I go and calibrate monitors, I regularly see OLEDs. It's, it's, mm. it's come very, very quickly. So yeah, maybe 4K monitors will drop the same way. I am one of my things to look at at, at NAB this year is is 4K displays and you know, trying to work out where we're at in terms of who's making them and uh, and what they look like and how much they cost. Other there are a lot of televisions with up converters in <laughs> HD oh, yeah. to 4K up converters in. Uh, I haven't I haven't had a look at any of those yet, but I, I do I do read with interest that they keep kind of popping up on. End gadget and tech crunch, you know, with their kind of up converters on. The, the kind of things that anyway, are the that's... province of rappers and football stars, you know, it's just absolutely need a forklift to put them on the wall. You will, yeah. We've we've seen that before, haven't we? We've, um... we've, we've just separated from the the shared storage. Well, Phil, get us back on track. Uh, well, we... no, no, no. Yes. I, I think I, th I think I think we've, we've, we've that's quite quite a lot of good stuff. Hugh, if, is there anything you'd like to um, just just bring back to the fore? Well, yeah, there, there are a couple of things. I mean, we 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 talked about a little bit and some of it's come across but just to to just to, to think about um the stuff you're using you mentioned uh, audio and uh, hundreds of small files uh, having an impact on the t on on the performance of your sand um it may be less of an issue as you were saying before you're going to be fairly hard put to find a sand that actually doesn't work for you as opposed to one that does um, if I've understood what you're saying, Rick, well, I think it might be a bit the, broad. The, 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 the comment about Pro Tools is, is or not Pro, just Pro Tools, but any audio, um, digital audio workstation, is that they have tiny, tiny files, and that does work the discs very, very hard. There is, um, what, what happened is Pro Tools 10 came out with a lot of hardware, which essentially means that you no longer write those files to disk because the audio processing hardware is now so much faster than it used to be. All of these things are done on the fly. They don't need. So they're all written. done in RAM, are they? And, you know, Essentially, basically. they're done in the in the Pro Tools 10 hardware. So you don't need to run disk and read them back from disk. So it's now actually much more straightforward to put Pro Tools 10 system on a shared storage than it would have been a Pro Tools 9 system. Um, in fact, the only system we are aware of that works reasonably flawlessly with Pro Tools. 
prior to 10 was in fact the DDP system because it was designed by guys in the audio world. And I rather fondly think of them deciding to make shared storage and thinking, well, let's do the audio because that's obviously going to be easier because the smaller files, you know, less bandwidth. And we'll do that. that that'll, be, that'll be the place to start. We'll move up to video. And ironically, that you know, unbeknownst to them, they'd chosen the much harder path. So they cracked audio. And in fact, you know, they have been quite widely adopted in, in Pro Tools circles as a shared audio storage device. Um, and then they moved on to video and found that it was enormously easy by comparison. So um, that's, that's one of those counterintuitive things about storage. It, uh, it's the little tiny files and lots of them that were the, the menace in shared audio. Um, and they continue. It's, it's still the case. If you've got a pre-10 Pro Tools, you probably don't and aren't attempting to share media on it. What you can do is obviously play back video media, excuse me, from your edit suite. So if you're mixing to a finished DNX HD or you know, QuickTime file, that can play back off the shared you know, Unity or ISIS or you know, whatever you've got. Generally speaking, though, you don't try and share the audio files amongst Pro Tools rooms unless you've got something like a DDP from Ardis, which, uh, which has got the, the kind of oomph to handle that. Right. Or 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 ten, so yeah. Well, let's say ten. Ten really isn't asking the same questions, so it's kind of it, it's a kind of get out of jail card, but it's it's one that's provided by the the higher performance audio hardware rather than some magical change in the shared storage environment. Okay. Well, th th there's uh, we, there are lots of actual practical everyday questions of, uh, uh, um about looking after your sound that we haven't touched, but maybe we've run out of time for today. We well, we, we are getting towards an hour. So, so, yes, so, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so that's splendid. Thank you very much, Rupert. It's, it's, it's really very good to have um, a knowledgeable person joining us. Fantastic. We're just uh, me and Hugh normally just gaff on about something and then uh, and kind of wonder if it's kind of going to find an audience. But this is uh, this has been splendid. Thank <laughs> I mean, you. The question with storage is, you know, what, what people want to know. I mean, it's possible that you can kind of you know go on information that people want to know more about. I mean, generally, it's it's an interaction between you know customers and, and, and people like us who do it for a living, um, and there are lots of, as you say, gotchas and questions. I mean, one of which is fragmentation. Is it an issue? You know, yada yada. I mean, the the thing is that store, shared storage has moved an awful long way, and and generally speaking, if you're a customer, you only buy it infrequently. You know, you tend to yes. you know purchase a sand and use it and make money out of it for two or three years, ideally, possibly more if you're lucky, uh, and it's only kind of idiots like us who constantly. Kind of like a like a like a rat in front of an electric probe, you know, poke the same the same thing again and again and again. So we're we're constantly kind of discovering where the, the kind of the, the boundaries are, if you like, in shared storage. And and one forgets, of course, that that's not not necessarily an experience customers share. And that's why I suppose they they come and talk to us about it. But it's often difficult to know from our perspective what people don't know and would like to know about shared storage. So that that would be a useful exercise, I suspect, to try and. Well on some sort of some classic man in the street questions or engineer in the in the machine room questions as to uh, what they want to know about shared storage or what what they find difficult to to uh, to find out engineer in the Nelly Dean an engineer in the Nelly Dean or many sweetheart <laughs> so there we are if you are watching and you have a um, person in the street engineer in the Nelly Dean the pub in Dean Street it's, it's, it's Dean Street isn't it Just yeah wondering. if you have a, some questions let let's have them because I'm fairly sure that for the price of a, a pint of a decent ale, young Rupert might make another appearance. Um, yeah. But uh, yes, it would be very good indeed to get a some, some tick feedback, tick some big questions. Gold. You, you go to the Maharani, don't forget to try the tick of gold. It's a fine, fine, fine. And then occasionally they have mongoose in there, which is very, very, very fine indeed. Mongoose? Mongoose, absolutely. It's very good. <laughs> well, thank you very much, Rupert and Phil over there. And totally I think good. that's it for us for, for this occasion. As ever, get in touch and let us know what you'd like us to chat about. Lovely. See you, chaps. Bye.